All right. Uh, <clears throat> let me begin with this very familiar story of Graham Staines. And uh, most of us here will be familiar with that, but just want to bring home the point that I'm going to make. And uh, this is the photograph of Graham and his son, sons and daughter and wife, Gladys. Um, as we know that in 1999, uh, Graham with his two sons, that is Philip H. 10 and Timothy H. 7, they were burned alive in their in their Jeep. And, uh, uh, but the work that they were doing as running the home for the lep leprosy people or leprous people or the lepers, they, they, the work continues. And the wife took on the mantle and she continued that work. And this is what amazes me when I read about the, the report by the, the, the New York Times of how Glady Staines respond to the killing or the, uh, the killing of, his, of her husband and two children. This is what is reported in the, uh, the New York Times. It says, when Mrs. Glady Staines heard about how her husband and two sons were burned alive the previous night, she shook with grief and for a time moved very slowly as if struggling to part her way through the air. She seemed to be impelled in the middle of the thought, which finally, with quavering voice, she shared, whoever did this, we will forgive them, she said. Whoever did this, we will forgive them. Whoever burned my husband and my children, we will forgive them. I think that comes out of a deep, love relationship with Jesus Christ out of the power that the Holy Spirit gave her at that point of time. I don't know about you, but I think I will find it extremely difficult to say that word, to say that those people who burn, let's say my wife and children, I will decide to forgive them. To say that word will be very, very difficult. Uh, sometimes when people wrong me, it is easy for me to release forgiveness. But when they hurt my wife and children, it is much more difficult. It takes a lot of grace from God to release forgiveness to that kind of people. And here she is. And I want to say that this is not Gladys' power, but it is the power of the gospel working in her life. And that same power is working in the lives of all of us right here in the room and online. And the, and the sermon that I want to speak, uh, speak about this afternoon is, how does the gospel empower me? How does the gospel empower me? As the gospel has empowered Gladys, how does the gospel continue to empower my life. That's what I want to talk about. And uh, my, my sermon will be based on Ephesians chapter 3 and uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 to 12. I'm going to read out from my Bible. It says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in, order, in, in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. And this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs to heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles and 
the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the, un the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his et eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. From this passage, I want to draw out three points. How does the gospel empower me? How does the gospel empower us? And the first point that I want to draw out here is the gospel empowers me to be a co-heir with Christ. The gospel empowers me to be a co-heir with Christ. And the passage that we've read just now, and verse 6, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6 says, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, the sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. So we are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. But to understand that, I think we need to understand a few things. And the first thing is that who are the Jews. Who are the Jews? It is simple. The Israelites are the Jews. God has chosen them as a chosen uh, tribe. And God chose Abraham so that all the descendants of Abraham becomes Israelites or the Jews. And they are chosen so that Jesus will come from the descendants of Abraham. And that's why they are chosen people. And that's why they are privileged. And that's why they become proud also. And unfortunately, many people, many of the Jews, when Jesus actually came, they rejected them. And that is rejected, rejected Jesus Christ. And that is why at this point of time, we have to pray for the, for the people of Israel. We have to pray for them. They are supposed to be the gospel bearer. They are supposed to be the channel of blessings. But now, because they rejected, many of them rejected, Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, now we have to pray for them. Now, who are the Gentiles? Who are the Gentiles? The Israelites or the Jews consider all other people apart from the Israelites, they consider them as Gentiles. And not only just say, saying that oh, these are different people, but they they look at other people with contempt. They think that these people are unclean people. Only we, the tribe of, of, of Israel, we are the holy one. We are the chosen one. We are the people who had the covenant with Jesus Christ, or we, with God. Abraham, our father, had a covenant with God. And you people, all of you, you have no part in that. All right. In some way, that's true. But that's true not only for, for us Gentiles, but it's true for them also. Until and unless they receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are not co-heirs with, with Christ Jesus. But Paul also explains to us about our condition as Gentiles before we come to know the Lord. And for that matter, I think all of us right now, we need to remember the time before we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. I don't know about you, but my life was completely in a mess. I was studying in a college, and I know that I'm, I was heading towards some kind of destructive life. But God, in his grace, gave me the gospel, opened my spiritual eyes, and helped me to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. And that is the beginning of the journey of a miracle. So think about your life. And Paul is saying this in Ephesians chapter 2, the previous chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse two and 13, uh, 12 and 13, he says, Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ. As we read this passage, would you like to remember your life before you received Christ? 
Let me read this again. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the beauty of it. Many of us, we are not placed better to become a Christian. Although some of us are born and brought up in a Christian family, we were not in a good place to become a Christ follower. In fact, because we were born and brought up in a Christian family, sometimes the gospel is not so attractive anymore. We become, what to say, gospel proof, sermon proof, and nothing can, can touch us. We become immune to the good news. And that's why none of us as Christians or, or believers in Christ or followers of Christ right now, none of us can claim that I was in a better position. I was a Christian material. We can't say that. And that is why anybody in the world, anybody I'm saying, anybody in the world, anyone from any background, any religion, we are same. We have the same opportunity. We were in the same condition in terms of receiving Christ as our Lord and Savior. You were not in a better place. I was not in a better place. It is by the grace of God that God reaches to us and we became a Christ followers. So that is the mystery. Or the question is, what is the mystery? The mystery is written here now. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 4 to 6 says, In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to people in other generations, that is in Old Testament, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. In a simple word, the mystery is that now the Gentiles and the Jews are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. But that was a mystery in the Old Testament. That was a mystery until Jesus Christ came. Even our father Abraham had, doesn't have the full knowledge of the gospel as we have right now. And that is why Paul's refer a mystery, mystery like that 21 times in his letters to the churches. It is so important that this mystery of we, that is Israelites and the Jews becoming co-heirs with Christ Jesus, it is so important that he was writing to different churches that we are all together. There is no, no division now. That we are, we are the called one, Israelites, and you are the lower one, Gentiles. Nothing like that. The, the, the barrier is already broken. It's already broken. We are all same brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And that is why I feel that Christianity is a very, very inclusive religion. Because none of us can claim that Jesus is exclusive for me. It is not for the one who is out there in the market. No, Jesus is mine. No, Jesus, Bible says that Jesus came and died for the world. And not for you and not for me, not for the Christians. Jesus is for everybody in the world. God, the Yahweh, has always other nations in his minds right from the beginning. When he chose Abraham, God told him that you will be a blessing to the nations. God has in mind that the nations will be blessed through Abraham and his descendants. God has always been inclusive of his thought when it comes to salvation. And that's why he has created, created us. And so we are now co-heirs in Christ Jesus. But this mystery was revealed through the Holy Spirit. 
it was not through his learning as 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 a scholar paul is definitely a scholar of his days he was a pharisee that means at least the five books of the bible the pentateuch he has memorized it he 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 knows the 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 scripture of those is on his fingertips but he didn't know this mystery while pursuing that knowledge scriptural knowledge but he knew this only after he encountered jesus christ and his revelation came only after the spirit of jesus christ revealed it to him and that is why it is so important for us as christians when we read the bible don't think that i i need to read this bible so that i will have more biblical knowledge no we need to read the bible so that this bible will become so relevant for my life that i can apply this bible to scripture every day in my life otherwise we can have much knowledge of scripture and nothing will change in our lives no transformation will take place unless the holy spirit as in this portion unless the holy spirit give us that revelation illumination and insight this bible will remain as some knowledge in at the back of your mind and so we need to really really ask the holy spirit to reveal us more and more of the secret things of god and this mystery was was unfolded in india in india when the apostle thomas came to india and he shared the gospel to people people started to embrace jesus christ and, and many many years after that the the britishers also came and many missionaries from the west they came and shared the gospel to us and the result was that all over india we can see the power of the gospel manifested in different forms and some of the forms that we can think of are the mission hospitals the good works and, and the acts of kindness that the christians were doing the orphanages is it not homes for the homeless people halfway homes homes for the children i was really uh encouraged by reading this report from azim premchi foundation azim premchi foundation they donated 500 crores to cmc velor and asked them to start a hospital in in chitur andhra pradesh and uh, in their interview uh, i mean in the press conference the ceo of azim premchi foundation anurag behar he was addressing the the press conference and he was saying uh, to this journalist that were there and he said i'm going to quiz you something and he asked them four questions have you heard of kunkuri and some says yes no and all that have you heard of bisam kutak have you heard of it anyone people who are in the morning don't say, okay jidan has heard that okay now have you heard of mithapura no have you heard of simdika i mean my pronunciation must be really wrong uh, i hope they won't hear this <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these are four places in chatisgarh odisha bihar and jharkhand and he asked them what do you think they have in common what do we think they have in common and some people said is it naxalites uh, so they they started to ask questions like or uh, is it tribal area but the ceo said no it is not and he said like this we went to each of these remote places during the covid pandemic and we found mission hospitals providing excellent care there a quality we wish we had in bangalore and in each of these places we found doctors and nurses trained in cmc that's what impressed us immensely and uh, we as a church we're proud to say that we also have a graduate doctor 
from CMC um, Ludhiana. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Binu Alexander. Yes, he is from CMC Ludhiana. He is not going after money, working in a private hospitals, earning lakhs and lakhs of rupees every month. But he has given up all that, and now he's serving other people in so many ways. I don't want to explain his profession right now because I don't know how uh, open he's in that sense. But he is making acts of kindness as his profession. We had Ashok Jako with us for a long time, and he also the same thing. He he he's a doctor, but he uh, worked with EHA and work for the poor for downtrodden people in the extreme uh, in interior villages of India. And so that is not normal. The normal doctors will not do that. The normal doctors will actually go for private hospitals and earn lots of money and lots of money and lots of money. That's always their aim. But these people, these doctors, were transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. They were so transformed that that earning money does not become their aim in life, but serving God through serving people became their aim in life. And that is the power of the gospel. God, gospel has really transformed all of us in some way or the other. Think about this, this story of Welsh revival. When the Welsh revival came, uh, many of these, these um, workers are from the coal mining areas. And, and these coal miners, they have these, these animals, driving the animals, bring the coal, coals into the factory. And so these, these factory workers, they were transformed during that revival, transformed by the power of the gospel. And so when they go, go back to their work, they, they, they stop using all kinds of foul languages. And so they word simple words like, go to the animal. No? The animal could not understand. The donkeys were not able to understand the language because there is no curse word after that, go. Normally, there is a prefix or a suffix before go. But here now, he, they're simply saying, go, go. And the animals will not move. So the animals were confused because there is a transformation in the life of these workers. There is a transformation in the heart, and that is why the words are also being transformed. I am sure those families, those workers' family members are celebrating in their homes because their father, fathers have stopped cursing people at home. Many years ago in, in Bombay Baptist Church, one Navy officer became a Christ follower all of a sudden. And he said, I am so surprised that I have stopped cursing people all of a sudden. Otherwise, I am used to this right from my training days. And I am always like this. So without using those curse words, it's not, not like me. And so there is transformation. When there is a transformation in our hearts, there is transformation in our words also. And I know that many of you are in the office, and this is many of our office colleagues. They just celebrate with all kinds of foul languages. And if they don't use that, they feel that they're out of place. Yeah. The Gen Z's will speak like this, right? If you don't speak all kinds of curse words, are you from the boomer generation? So in order to be in with the group, you have to use the curse words. But we, as Christians, as Christ followers, we don't do that. We don't do that. Because our value system are very different from them. We are also called by Apostle Peter in his book that we are peculiar people. And we are proud about that, that we are peculiar people. We are different. We are different. And that is the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. So the mystery, coming back to the mystery once again, the mystery is that now the Gentiles and the Jews are co-heirs in Christ Jesus. And that is why, though you are from different parts of India, we are all co-heirs in Christ 
Jesus. It's not that the South Indian will have little less, less, and uh, North East people will have more. Nothing like that. It's all the same. Everyone are same in the sight of God. We are all co-heirs in Christ Jesus. And when I look at every one of you, you you're coming from different places, but I feel that connection, that closeness with all of you because we are bound by the blood of Jesus Christ. Think about it. In any Christian, Christian gathering, just in, in, a, in a very new place, a new gathering, you go and walk inside that Christian gathering. Joy, Joy Lin was there in uh, South Korea. 5,000 Christians were there. And I feel that she would have filled that connection with, that five, with those 5,000 people. It's like that. It's like a magic. The gospel works like a magic. And that's because we are bound by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll show you one picture. And that is Yeshu Darbar picture. And uh, Professor and Vice Chancellor uh, Rajendra B. Lal, when he conducts Yeshu Darbar, there are at least 50,000 to 60,000 people gathered in an open area. Open area. Okay? And many of the politicians, Indian politicians, will come and visit this place. And they will be so surprised how the meeting is conducted with so much of discipline and silence. Think about this in a political rally, a BJP rally or a Congress rally or Ahmadmi, whatever. If 50,000 people gather, there will be four or five fights. There will be so much of chaos. There will be so much of words that are exchanged and slogans and all kinds of shouts will be there. But in this gathering, Yeshu Darbar, 50, 60,000 people, quietly they will take their place. Whatever is being said is being received. And that is the power of the gospel working amongst us. All right. Moving on to the next point. How does the gospel empower me? The gospel empowers my local church. And that is exciting. The, the, the gospel empowers my local church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 says, His intent was that now, through the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be, should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he talks about the rulers and authorities. The rulers and authorities that they are simply put Satan and his people and his demons. So we as a church, we are given the authority and the power to make known the gospel to the rulers and authorities of the heavenly realms. And that is Satan and his demons. Basically, the works of the demons and the Satan will be crushed by the church will be crushed by the church and that is the kind of power that God has given to the local church because Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 16 I will build my church and the gates of hell that is the, the Satan and his demons shall not prevail against it God has entrusted us this local church with power from above I really like the definition of Bill Hybels about the local church, the hope of the world. He says this, There is nothing like the local church when it's working right. Its beauty is indescribable. Its power is breathtaking. Its potential is unlimited. It comforts the grieving and heals the broken in the context of community. It builds bridges to seekers and opens his arms to the forgotten, the downtrodden, and the disillusioned. It breaks the chains of addictions, frees the oppressed, and offers belonging to the marginalized of this world. The potential of the local church is almost more than I can grasp, or I can understand, or I can imagine. We are empowered. As a church, we are really, really empowered. Just take for example, sin against children 
in India. It is rampant, child labor and all kinds of abuse that are happening with the children. And we as a church, we have the mandate to work for that liberation. In India, among 22 crores of children, only 10.5 crores of them are attending the school. And uh, Anil Gujar uh, and, and Pearson, they are the witness that even though they try their level best to bring these children to the tuition center, the parents are not, they don't care about their children. The parents are in their workplace and children are just playing at home. They don't go to school. They can't even bring them to the tuition center, which is just a few blocks away from the house. They just don't care about children's education. And that is why so many children, half of our children in India, are not going to proper school. And we, as a church, we have the mandate to go after them and do something, do something. Sin against women. Among the sexually abused women, 20% of them are girls below 15 years. For every 26 minutes, one woman is physically abused in India. And, and what are we as a church doing about this? It's my prayer that some of our church members will stand up for the right of the children, for the right of the women. And that reputation of Delhi, named as the rape capital and everything, should change because some people stood up against that. It should change. It's the mandate to the local church that is you and me. The last point, how does the gospel empower me? The gospel empowers me with the Holy Spirit. The gospel empowers me with the Holy Spirit. You are given a new power, dunamis. You are given a new power. Dunamis is the Greek word for power. And from that word, we derive the word dynamic, dynamic leadership course. Those of you who are there part of dynamic leadership course, you're really dynamic. You're explosive. And the word dynamite also comes from this. The bombs are made with dynamites. And so in that sense, the spirit of the Lord who is inside of us is so powerful within us. The thing is we have suppressed him again and again within us. And that is why the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit is not able to manifest in our lives. And in fact, you are empowered to preach the good news. That's the next point. I am empowered to preach the good news. The mandate is there, and the empowerment is also there. Ephesians 3, 8, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ Jesus. It's not a false humility. He's saying that when I look at Jesus, I am nothing. When I look at my past life, I am the worst, Paul is saying. And just like that, most of us, our background is really bad. Our kind of life that we lived before we, we received Christ Jesus, it was really bad. It was messy. We don't deserve it. We are the least. But God in his grace and love has given us that power to preach the gospel wherever we go. To live out that gospel. To live out that gospel and to preach the gospel. I just want to conclude this message by saying this. Gospel empowers us in three ways. Number one is position as co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And number two, gospel gave us the body of Christ. And we belong to the body. And gospel also gives us the Holy Spirit who is inside of us, the dunamis who lives inside of us. I believe that the gospel is working in every one of our lives. Everyone. If you, if you 
listen to your heart quietly. You will know that your life has been changing ever since you met Jesus Christ. And your life is transformed ever since you met Jesus Christ. And we should not stop with your own transformation, but your transformation should become the sent one, that is the ambassadors, in wherever we are placed and become the salt and light of this world as Jesus desired for us. Thank you very much. Thank you.